Hello, everyone. Welcome to ID24. Uh, we're excited for our next speaker, Ian Hamilton. Uh, his uh, talk is on Changing Tides 2015. It's uh, Game Industry Accessibility Advancements. I'm here with my colleague, Michiel. Michiel, uh, you want to say hi? Yeah. He's dressed, I, I, as, a, <laughs> he's dressed as, a design, <laughs> as a dinosaur. Don't be alarmed. Uh, if you've been here for the entire ID24, uh, you're probably in dire need of sleep, but uh, we're happy you're still with us. And if you're just joining us, uh, we've got a few hours left, so really excited for this one. And uh, we're going to pass it over to Ian. You're in dire need of sleep, but uh, we're happy you're still with us. And if you're just joining us, uh, we've got a few hours left, so really excited for this one. And uh, we're going to pass it over to Ian. Who is that? But, uh, we're happy you're still with us. I think someone might have their. Uh, Again, some have feedback. The feed. Yeah, I believe we have. Someone has uh, the video playing somewhere else, perhaps. I think someone might have their. Uh, Again, some feedback. Yeah, I believe we have. Someone has uh, the video playing somewhere else, perhaps. Boom. We good, yeah? Uh, did that take it? Somebody, somebody else. Somebody else. Um, because I can hear myself. Yeah, I can hear you, Michael. Maybe you should just start the talk. <laughs> okay, right. I'll start then. Hey, so um, uh, uh, please don't forget to send any questions to the hashtag uh, ID24. Uh, so. so. All yours. Great. Nice one. Cool. OK, so uh, my name is uh, Ian Hamilton. I'm a UX designer and an accessibility specialist. And um, I used to work um, internally across accessibility um, in both web and games. And I now work in the wider industry, both as a consultant and an advocate on raising awareness and all that kind of stuff as well. And um, I've been working in, in the field for just coming up on 10 years now. And it's been quite exciting seeing the pace at which things have been changing. In particular, it's been really, really accelerating over the past couple of years. And that's what I've got a bit for you today, um, some of the quite exciting things that have been going on in gaming in the past year. So, I'm going to keep the intro short because um, I'm guessing uh, most of the people watching will have a good idea about the um, value of accessibility. But um, what I am going to talk to you a little bit about is the value of gaming. Because in the accessibility community, you still, from time to time, get the question of you know, why accessibility in gaming? Why expend effort on that when there are so many other things that need attention? And the answer is a really simple one. Accessibility in gaming is important because gaming is important. Firstly, it's important financially. So that's what this figure on the screen is, the 90 billion. According to Newzoo, gaming is now a 90 billion dollar industry. And it's set to top 100 billion in 2017. So to give you some kind of context of what that figure means, the music industry is 15 billion. Movie business, 50 billion. So to get to that same kind of figure, that 90 billion figure, you actually have to gather together all filmed entertainment. So that means cinema, DVDs, Blu-rays, the subscription stuff like Netflix. If you add together all those industries, you get to the same kind of size as the games industry. So something of that scale is obviously a really big part of our culture, which means it's also a big deal to be excluded from it. And here's the thing about gaming. A good deal of accessibility in other industries is aimed at the basics, right? So making sure that people can get into buildings, cross a road, can use a government website, and that kind of stuff. But life isn't about existing on those kind of basics. More what games bring to the table is access to recreation, to culture, to socializing. You know, these are all really critically important things. They're things that are specifically recognized by the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. 
and they are things that can really make the difference between existing and living. So that kind of brings me on to the first and potentially the most significant development that happened in the past year, which is CVAA. The so CVAA is uh, legislation in the USA, which was originally signed in by Obama in 2010. It stands for the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act. It recognizes how important both of those things, communications and video, are in the lives of people with disabilities, and it requires them both to be universally accessible. So legislation covers a broad swathe of technology and has some really specific requirements. So an example of that is there is a fixed set of customization options that must be available for the presentation of subtitles and captions, which is why you now see the same set of options across YouTube, Netflix, smartphones, and so on. So full control over size, font, letterboxing, that kind of thing. And the Act also specifically includes gaming. And it divides gaming into three classes. The first class is consoles, so Xbox, PlayStation. The second class is gameplay and distribution networks. So that means things like Xbox Live, PlayStation Network, Steam. And then lastly, there's class three, which is game software, the games themselves. Now, when this came in, there were a number of different industries, which includes gaming, that applied for a temporary waiver from the Act. The games industry itself was given a two-year waiver. And the reason for this is to be able to put some R&D time in to figure out the best way to deliver this kind of stuff. And that two-year waiver expired in October 2015. And when that happened, there was a further waiver granted for game software, which runs until next year, which again was provided in order to um, allow some R&D time for the platform holders, for the game studios to uh, figure out the best way to deliver this kind of stuff in games. So what that means is that the other two classes, the games consoles, the networks, since October have been legally required to make the communication and broadcast video elements of any of their new or majorly updated products accessible to people with all kinds of impairments. There is the usual USA blanket exemption here as well, so if you are a small company with, I think it's less than 30 employees, it doesn't apply. So the broadcast video element of CVAA, this only really applies to the class one, which is the consoles. So if you're watching you know, a DVD or Netflix or something of that thing. The communication element applies across the board. So that requires things like party chat to be accessible. So what does it mean? Well, during 2015, we've seen both Sony and Microsoft, for the first time, implementing accessibility features into consoles. And you heard a bit about some of the export stuff earlier from Bryce. The feature set across both of the consoles is fairly similar. So they both now offer a system level screen reader, providing text to speech for blind users, full system level button remapping, configurable caption presentation for broadcast video, and high contrast and zoom modes. And the zoom mode you can actually use in games. Of the two, PlayStation currently has the edge in terms of the breadth of the features that are covered. So it also goes as far as things like um, control over the speed at which dynamic text scrolls up. And Xbox, on the other hand, currently have the edge in terms of the depth of the features. So for example, their screen reader, which is across most of the system. The zoom's really powerful. It also has a really good high contrast mode that actually applies to some of the apps as well as the core system UI. But the thing about Xbox that's really, really interesting isn't so much the features, it's the approach that goes around it, which has been really open. Open public social media dialogue about what work is being done. They also have a dedicated accessibility area in their feedback forums, specifically asking for feedback on accessibility. 
and they also have video guidance on the features themselves. Now this video is probably going to be a bit choppy because it's, it's kind of streaming a stream, but, but hopefully you should be able to get the gist. Xbox One has ease of access features like a narrator, magnifier, and closed captioning. Here's how to turn them on. Go to settings. Ease of access. Select an option to turn it on or off and get information about how it works. Narrator reads text on your screen out loud like this. Starting narrator. Window. Select it. Off. One of two. Exiting narrator. You don't have to go to settings to turn narrator on or off. Instead, hold the Xbox button until it vibrates and then press the menu button. Magnifier zooms in to part of the screen. The controller shortcut is similar to Narrator. Hold the Xbox button, but then press the View button. Zoom in further with the right trigger, and exit by pressing B. Close text. So, it keeps them going for a while, but you get the kind of gist. So this kind of approach, it has kind of obvious direct benefits of kind of opening up the channel's communication and letting people know what's there. But it's also generated a lot of goodwill towards them from their customers as well. And this has been a really key part of not just Xbox, but Microsoft's accessibility efforts across all of their product areas recently. And if more companies and other industries could take a similar approach, I think that would be a really, really great thing. Now, it's kind of tempting to think that, you know, Sony and Microsoft are only doing this because their arms being twisted by the legislation, but that's really not the case at all. So there's been people, passionate people there, working to get accessibility through for a long time. You know, if legislation helped to give a bit more impetus or help conversations happen at a wider or a higher level, that's no bad thing. And it's not the start and the end of it either. Because, you know, already both consoles go above and beyond those initial CVAA requirements. And also both of them have continued to improve the accessibility functionality after the launch. And now that door's been opened, now that there's wider awareness about the possibilities of accessibility, I hope that's something that will continue on in the future. And it's also going to be interesting to see to what extent Nintendo joins them with their new console that's coming out soon, the NX. So next up, still with Sony, is um, evaluation tools. So over the past year, both Sony and the BBC have taken a similar approach, which has been evaluating existing accessibility guidelines that are available in the public domain and using those to produce internal evaluation tools. So these are you know, simple checklists of features. And in Sony's case, that's backed up by also a bank of detailed design patterns. The approach varies a little bit between the two companies. Um, in Sony's case, this is you know, an optional service that's initially offered to their European studios, but BBC take theirs a bit further. So the BBC is a publicly funded organization, so they have a really strong and advanced accessibility culture with a pretty much universal understanding there that efforts have to be made to ensure that all the content is available to everyone. So they actually require all of their first and third party games to comply with as much of the lists as is reasonably possible. Now while there's good work being done by both individuals within these gaming companies and individuals outside them as well, another really important aspect is advocacy groups. So there's the IGBA's accessibility group. They've been involved in a number of initiatives over the past year, from producing an educational framework to supporting funding bodies. There's also the charities, Able Gamers, Special Effects. They've both seen big increases in the donations, which has obviously been able to increase their outreach work. So Special Effects have gained a new facility, which was opened by a cross-party delegation of senior politicians, which included the Prime Minister of the UK and also the Deputy Opposition Leader, and all of these politicians making public statements in support of accessibility in games. Able Gamers have launched their Expansion Packs initiative, 
which is donations of bundles of assistive tech to group homes, daycare centres, long-term living facilities, that kind of thing. And they've also kicked off the Able Gamers Fellowship, which is an initiative that's aimed at improving diversity in game studios themselves through scholarship funding and mentoring for disabled students. And something that people from all of these groups have been doing a lot of is conference talks and awareness raising events. And lots of other people have been too. Um, in particular this year at CSUN, which is the main accessibility conference, there was a record number of gaming sessions. And also the week previously at GDC, which is the main gaming conference, there was record attendance for the accessibility talks there. So now there was about 120 odd people turned out to each session. Last year, about 80. Year before that, 60. Year before that, 40. So it's really nice to see that progression year to year. As well as the big ones, there's all kinds of other smaller organizations, websites. So you've got existing ones, such as Degas, Audio Games, OneSwitch, Ability Powered, Apple. This. They've all had continued success. There's been new ones as well, such as AccessibleGamer.com and the relaunch of the industry stalwart GameAccessibility.com. So next up, engines. So most games are developed using engines. Middleware frameworks, these take care of common, co sorry, common tasks, things like getting visuals onto the screen or exporting across different devices. Traditionally, these have been a big blocker to accessibility through incompatibility with technologies such as screen readers. But in the past year, that has finally started to change. So the Unreal Engine now has a built-in colorblindness simulator. The latest beta of, the un of uh, Unity 3D includes remapping functionality, so gamers can fully reconfigure the controls to a setup they need. Also with the ability to combine inputs from any number of different devices. So you know you could map fire to be a mouse button, space to be a button on your wheelchair headrest. All really nice stuff, and it's just done for developers. All they need to do is put the interface on top. So, you know, this is only early days for the engines, but it's a good sign because the public dialogue with them is starting to change, you know, from ignoring these kind of issues to actually being interested. So hopefully over the next year or two, that will continue and we'll see engines carry on moving from being a blocker to actually being a big enabler for accessibility. Now what we've got on the screen at the moment is a picture of a boy using a switch. So this advance is relating to iOS's built-in support for custom input devices. So things like a headrest button, a sit puff tube, blink detector, that kind of stuff. The kind of tech that Stephen Hawking uses. So these are devices that are perfectly suited to controlling single button games. There is support on iOS for these kind of devices, but it's implemented in a way that's incompatible with games. So basically you have a crosshair that moves across the screen to choose a point. You then make an input to choose that point. After that, you then have to choose another coordinate again, make another input. You know, for something like a productivity app, that is great. But if you're playing something like Flappy Birds, you choose a coordinate, Flat. Go to choose another coordinate again, you're dead by the time you get there. So Barry Ellis, um, he works for Special Effect and also um, runs OneSwitch.org.uk. He put together a really, really nice plea video setting out you know, everything that's good about iOS's current approach and also setting out how it could be improved to allow access to these games. You know, had it signed at the end by all kinds of different advocates and developers and it is now in. So as of iOS 9, you can now choose a coordinate and then make repeated presses at that point. So it's a really, really simple thing, but what that means is that thousands of games were instantly made compatible with this technology overnight with no effort at all from developers. And we also had interesting things happening with funding. So there's a funding program in Australia called Film Victoria that's had accessibility criteria as part of this application process for a number of years now. So this is kind of need to looking at again, refreshing. 
and that's done now. The updated criteria and advice are all live and in use. And this is really one of the big, big success stories in accessibility, in game accessibility. Even. So in the three years that it's running, in the three years that Film Victoria has had accessibility criteria in its application process, they have never had a single applicant fail to consider accessibility to some degree. So what this means is not only you know, the accessibility of the output of games that have gone through this funding program, it means that the Melbourne community is the most accessibility savvy that certainly I've come across anyway, anywhere. So you know, the people that go through the funding program, the people that read the guidelines for the funding program, even if they don't apply, the people that those people then go and talk to. You know, the knowledge about accessibility has really, really spread a long way as a result of this. And now, last year, the same approach has been taken up by Creative Europe. And this is a huge, huge European funding body. And they did this using Film Victoria as a case study. So this, again, we've already seen this with Film Victoria and also with Screen Australia, another Australian one. You know this kind of stuff works. So if anyone has any ties at all with any funding bodies, across any industries, this is a really, really worthwhile thing to pursue. So we've seen how much of a difference it can make, and it's really for very little effort as well. And next up, game jams. So what you can see here is a bunch of developers all sat around a big table. And if you aren't familiar with game jams, it's basically the game industry's way of describing hackathons. So you basically have a bunch of developers who are given a theme to work to and a very limited time scale, usually just you know a couple of days, and have to form themselves into teams and produce complete games by the time the deadline is up. And the biggest of these is Global Game Jam. So you've got a picture of a pretty big crowd here. Um, this big crowd is actually just from one single venue and there are hundreds of venues around the world like this that take part every January. Now Global Game Jam has generally had some degree of accessibility in it, but this year Global Game Jam hired an executive producer to oversee everything, and for that they chose someone called Giselle Rosman, who is a really, really strong advocate for accessibility. So as a result this year, we're able to get six different optional accessibility challenges included. So things like one-handed, custom controller, high contrast, no visuals, that kind of thing. And these challenges were taken up by over 3,000 teams of developers, which you know, probably equates to around 10,000 game developers, which is a pretty huge, huge increase from previous years. And obviously that means it is a really staggering amount of awareness raising and you know, misconception busting as well. Loads of people learning that actually there's a load of really, really nice stuff that can be done in a very, very short space of time. You know, breaking those myths about how long it takes, how difficult it is, that kind of thing. So all this stuff is all well and good, but of course there's also the games themselves. The levels of awareness and implementation have continued to slowly but surely increase. Um, epilepsy and colour blindness in particular saw really, really big increases in consideration in 2015. And something that's been really interesting to see is the shift of attitudes of consumers as a result of this greater implementation. So it was only really a couple of years ago, you know, back in 2014, that considering colour blindness was a headline news story. You now games like SimCity, Borderlands 2, they were gaining you know, pretty major press coverage for their efforts. Now, 2016, sorry, 2015 even, gamers were coming to expect companies consider it. So the social media reaction to the lack of colorblind friendliness in both Black Ops 3 and The Witness was pretty intense. And in The Witness, um, there was a a lot of debate and commentary, including um, a really prominent journalist actually writing an apology piece for failing to mention in reviews when games are colorblind friendly. So, you know, to see that kind of turnaround from it being a headline news story to something that people are actually apologizing for not covering, that's a huge, huge turnaround in a very short space of time.
And then at a more niche end of the spectrum, you know, color blinds, this is fairly prevalent. Other end of the spectrum, the current generation of consoles has actually seen now two dedicated efforts to bring blind accessibility to AAA gaming. Firstly, the accessibility mode that was added to Mortal Kombat X, which adds in additional sound keys for background objects and power meters. And secondly, Killer Instinct, which was patched in November to add in a HUD UI slider to separate out the various noises for power meters being charged, that kind of stuff in the background music, and also some additional sounds for some of the moves that didn't yet have unique sounds to them yet. So both these games, you know, big, big, big name games, putting dedicated effort into blind accessibility. We haven't really seen that before. But it's not just about the features that have been implemented. There's also been advances in the way that accessibility is approached around that. So what we've got on the screen is um, from Turtle Rock, um, who published basically what's an accessibility statement detailing what considerations they've already made, making a public commitment to further work. So you know this kind of stuff is common in other industries, like you go to websites, it's common enough to see an accessibility statement, but this kind of stuff in gaming, it just hasn't happened before. This is a big, big news. And also, following feedback that we're getting after launch, CD Projekt Red patched a number of accessibility considerations into The Witcher 3 in the weeks following the launch. So this included patching in full button remapping, a colorblind mode, and also improving the size and the contrast of the text. So this screenshot of the Witcher, you can see in the middle, there's really, really tiny low contrast text. That's one of the things they went straight back in and patched, which, you know, would not have been easy and cheap to do. And this kind of thing, you know, like patching accessibility fixes in post-launch, that's not really something new. However, the speed and the priority that it was done in. You know, CD Projekt Red's prioritizing this kind of stuff right up there with the really major game-breaking things. That is new. And then we had Harmonix as well. Um, so Harmonix is the developer of Rock Band. So when they were in the early stages of developing the latest Rock Band game, they actually put an open public call on their forums, asking their community for input on what kind of accessibility stuff they might be able to consider in their new game. And that got them 18 pages of suggestions. And of course, this increase in implementation is reflected pretty nicely in this year's crop of accessibility awards. So we had uh, Rocket League and um, MLB The Show winning Able Gamers Awards. We had Heroes of the Storm winning Degas Award. And also Ryan North is To Be or Not To Be winning the Australian Game Developer Associations Award. You know, all these games all doing very, very different things and opening up games to new audiences. So you've heard what's hopefully been a few interesting things now. So you know, the door finally being open to accessibility on consoles and in engines, all kinds of nice initiatives happening and increased awareness and implementation. But what's it all add up to? Well, accessibility in gaming is still at a low level compared to where it needs to be and compared to other industries as well. But the pace of change is accelerating. We need to maintain that. And to maintain that, we need as many people as possible, pushing from as many angles as possible. So this link that's up on the screen is a list of advocacy activities and goals. Now, if anyone wants to get involved, there's lots of interesting and good things that can be done. But even outside that, there is a very, very simple thing that anyone who's watching this can do, and that is just keep the conversation going. Now, talk to developers, talk to gamers, talk to anyone who will listen. Because if more and more people are starting to think about this stuff, starting to realize its importance, we can't let them forget. And if we can do that, if we can keep that momentum going, then hopefully this time next year, we will be looking at a very different landscape again. Hey guys, are you there? Hey Ian, how's it going? Hey. 
We didn't. We didn't. We didn't abandon you, man. <laughs> Good stuff. Uh, yep, I'm back. Good, good. I, I I got a I got a headphone, so it, it, it shouldn't echo now. So you had a, you had a wardrobe change as well. I can see you're no longer dressed as a dinosaur. Yeah, in in order for the for the headset to work, <laughs> I, I need to get rid of the dinosaur. So. <laughs> but Ian, great talk. Uh, that was really yeah, interesting. Right. Uh, well, we're out really, really quickly, actually. So I guess we've got a fair bit of spare time for those questions and stuff. Uh, yeah, I I kept an eye on on Twitter, but I I think you did a a wonderful job explaining because there's no questions. Um, I I do have a question though because you talk a lot about uh, digital accessibility for 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 games. Um, which is great, but do you have any experience with like uh, board games and, and card games um, being made accessible? Yeah, yeah, actually, um, a little bit. Yes, yeah. so it's not really not really my primary, but I do follow it, and there's been some interesting movements in that. So, I, mean, I said, you know, the, the level of accessibility awareness and implementation in digital games is quite far behind other industries. So things like web construction, that kind of stuff. In uh, physical games, it is further behind again. Hmm. But there are people who are starting to pay attention. Um, and there's all kinds of interesting issues. Some of it overlaps with um, digital games. Some of them are unique. So you have issues around, for example, like with motorability, the actual manipulation of individual game pieces, and just things like being able right. to hold cards. Um, left, right hand in this as well, being able to fan out and pack of cards in the right direction. So there are things that are unique to um, tabletop games. But there is something else that's interesting about tabletop games, which is the potential to make a difference. Because gaming is a really, really big industry. And tabletop gaming is growing really rapidly, but it is still a much smaller industry. So it would only really take a few key publishers to start thinking about this kind of stuff. And we see you know, really, really wide changes really quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, something that's got loads of potential as well. I mean, I was talking earlier about the, the kind of benefits of gaming, so things, you know, like the recreation, the culture, the socializing. That's the thing with the tabletop stuff. The vast majority, I mean, a couple of exceptions like Chainsaw Warrior and stuff aside, the vast majority of tabletop gaming is a really, really social, inclusive activity, you know? So it's got real, right. real big opportunities for inclusion. Yeah, and... Um uh, uh, Matilda, my, my girlfriend, came across a website because we were looking into this, into like uh, the, the tabletop gaming, uh, for uh, for some accessibility meetups. So we would like to bring some games and, and you know yeah. play some games. Um, so we were looking into how to make those games accessible, or, or, or if there were any accessible games available. And we came across a website called uh, uh, 64OunceGames.com. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with, with where the 64 is is numbers and the rest is written out. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't ordered anything from them, but it, it looked really promising. So, um, it, yeah, so I love ideas like that, which are just just so simple that you just can't yeah. imagine not having been had in there. So, so basically, if people haven't come across this, yeah, it's a company called 64 Ounce Games. And um, basically, if you, you know, if you're playing like Magic the Gathering, that kind of stuff, you've got loads of cards. It's quite common for people to. Um, have like little plastic sleeves that they keep their cards in, and um, the, the people behind 64 Ounce Games had a genius idea. So basically, you do already get kind of like there are a few games, just like a Monopoly and that kind of stuff, where you can actually buy Braille versions of the games. Um, right. They're really expensive. You know, the, the expense of making those games means that there's only a couple of those game. You know, like Monopoly and stuff, really popular ones that are made. So 64 Art Games had a genius idea of getting a Braille printer and printing Braille onto these plastic overlays. Yeah. So now they, it's, it's really, really cheap and easy for them to do. So they just you know, take requests from people about games they want to play, and they actually just make these Braille kits and send them out to people and be able to do it, and they can do it really cheaply and really easily. So you know, I just love the ideas that were just such, such a simple idea that works so well. Yeah, it's really great. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, so, so our, um, there's a, a site that started up recently, actually, called um, Meeple Like Us. Okay. Which, um, that is uh, Michael Heron, uh, someone else as well. I can't remember who, but Michael Heron, Heron is one of them. And um, they do, um, they basically do a similar purpose to sites like um, Unstoppable Gamer and Dagas and Game Accessibility 
uh, dot com. What they do for digital games is like uh, reviews and accessibility breakdowns of video games. And Meeple like us does the same thing for um, tabletop games. Awesome. I'm just looking at the website. But very cool. Very good. Yeah. So for the people who misunderstood that, for people like us, it's actually Meeple, so uh, M-E-E-P-L-E, -E, uh, like us, dot com, is it? Just to clarify, oh, dot co, dot UK, sorry. UK, yeah. Cool. Yeah, also, even if you just look on um, boardgamegeek.com, which is kind of okay. the main portal for tabletop games, that kind of stuff. Um, they have a fair bit of accessibility stuff on there as well. So they often talk about um, you know, whether a game is colorblind friendly or not, that kind of stuff in the descriptions of games. Um, there's also a guy called Jacob Wood who is quite active on there, and he does a lot in tabletop accessibility. Um, also, Elsa Henry, who is SnarkBat on Twitter. Um, she's a really, really good person to talk to about the social aspect of it. So in you know, role-playing games in person, um, even uh, live-action role-playing games, that kind of stuff as well. OK, awesome. Uh, so um, yeah, it, have you seen any, any games where they, they try to like, implement, or like digital games, where they try to implement like, a, a color blindness feature, uh, but sort of got it wrong? Or is, so <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, yeah, definitely. Um, it's it's fr really frustrating to see because you know you've got developers who really have got their hearts in the right place and really want to do something good, but have just kind of you know, slightly got the wrong end of the stick. And um, so they basically there's a bit of a chain. So um, starting with um, World of Warcraft. So mm -hmm. World of Warcraft, um, they'd actually um, implemented accessibility um, simulators into the game for their developers to use. And those could be turned on using the um, console in the game. And um, basically, word got out to gamers that there was these console commands that would do these, put these colorblind modes on. And people started kind of experimenting with them. So it looks like what happened basically was once that happened, um, Blizzard basically took those colorblind simulators and tried to turn them into colorblind fixes. And they're basically like deltonization, that kind of thing. Um, but they kind of got a bit of the wrong end of the stick. You, Firstly, it kind of tweaks colors in a bit of the wrong way, in the wrong direction. But also, you can't really use a filter. Like even, even a really good deltonization filter, you can't really use that on games because there are so many colors present in a game at any one time. So basically, right. you might, it might fix you know, like your red-green issues with some of the interface. Fix them perfectly, but it just swaps that for another issue somewhere along the color spectrum. Right. Yeah. So basically, they've taken, they've taken that same approach and then applied it, applied it to um, Overwatch which is, um, that's coming out, and I think it's coming out next week, but they had an um, open beta of it. They've taken that same approach, which is frustrating to see because, you know, the colorblind simulators they've got in there, for some people, really, really helpful, but for other people, you know, I've seen so many comments on Twitter, Reddit, all that kind of stuff, and people who are really frustrated because they've seen these colorblind modes turn them on, and they just don't help, or in some cases, make it worse. Right. But thankfully, there's not very many games who have taken that approach. There's um, two others. Um, there's... Um, Doom, the new Doom, um, takes that approach. Also, there was a Call of Duty, a couple of Call of Duty games back that did that. But generally speaking, though, people people have a pretty good idea about how to design for colorblindness. Um, normally, the issues about colorblindness are maybe you know one or two interface elements that weren't covered by the mode. So, for example, in um, the Division, they've got really nice colorblind modes, um, okay. but it doesn't cover the um, indicators above enemies' heads. They stay red all the time. So if you've got protonopia, if you are red deficient, those reds are difficult to distinguish from the background. That's normally the kind of issues you have with colorblind modes. It's just like a, kind of like a little flaw, something being missed out from it. Generally speaking, developers do do a good job of it, and it's been really nice to see. Because like I said, you know, it was it was only 2014 that um, it was big big front page news if a game considered colorblindness. So to move from that in the space of you know by the end of 2015, when it's just kind of standard, developers get it. Right. You know, and especially with, you know, like Unreal putting a colorblind simulator in, you know, if the engines can provide these kind of tools, then not only is it going to help developers implement this kind of stuff, 
it's also going to raise awareness as well. You know, if developers come across that thing in the settings, you might learn some of the color blindness that they might not have thought about before. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's exciting. So yeah. Yeah, it's exciting seeing the end design to do this, to do this kind of stuff because you know, there's, there's been a lot of people trying for a long time to try and make the case for the kind of stuff that engines can do. So to actually see them starting to implement this kind of stuff is really, really nice. I think there's a general symptom of the way things are in the industry as well. You know, it's, it's kind of reaching tipping point. That is, you know, a couple of years ago, it was really, really common to meet developers, have a conversation about accessibility, and you actually be, oh, um, people, people with disabilities play games. Oh, that's, that's really interesting. I'll, I'll have to look into that. You know? Whereas now, the more common response is like, oh, um, yeah, yeah, we were thinking about color blindness. Yeah, maybe we could do some other things. You know? So you can gradually see that people are more aware and things are starting to turn. Now, I was at, I was at a conference um, this morning, game developer conference this morning. I was looking around the show floor. They had games being demoed. And just looking around, the number of games that had, you know, colorblind friendly schemes by default was really, really nice to see. And I went out to one of them and asked them, I said, you know, like, your two characters in this game are blue and orange. Is there a reason why you made them blue and orange? And they said, yes, for color blindness. You know? Just matter of fact. A couple of years ago, you wouldn't have got that answer at all. Well, that's, that's, that's an improvement then. Um, and I also saw uh, um, uh, on CSUN, at the uh, somewhere at the stand, they had like um, a game you could control with your eyes. So you, you would just look at the screen, and sort of the cursor would sort of follow your your eyes. Uh, so it was it was sort of jittery, but it did work, and uh, it was a fairly simple game. I, <clears throat> you had to sort of connect pieces on on the screen and, and make a figure or something. Um, so uh, are there any other like development, you, you talked a, bit, a little bit about switch ac switch access and, and such, but are there any uh, like like specialized um, input methods for for games, or uh, just to make it easier anyway? Um, yeah, we well can get um, uh, custom custom dedicated game controllers. So there's um, like called um, Ben Heck, who does um, custom like left-handed controllers, that kind of stuff. So basically, you got the two sticks on the controller, taking one of the sticks and putting it on the bottom of the controller. So you can hold it on one hand and push the stick against your leg and control it one-handed. Um, right. There's uh, evil controllers. Um, they make a, a device called the Adroit, which is basically a switch box that plugs into uh, plugs into the, um, as a controller. So all the inputs for the, all the different controller buttons, you can connect any kind of accessibility switches to them and basically build up your own control schemes. Um, but a lot of it is just kind of standard stuff. I mean, you mentioned about the eye tracking. Um, uh, special effect do a lot of work with that, and they've actually got some pretty complex games working with that. So I think they had a demo running of. Um, oh yeah, actually seen it. Yeah, there was a um, they put up a picture recently of there was a girl in a hospital, hospital bed who was playing Minecraft via eye control in a hospital bed. Oh. So really, really wow. nice. Basically, it's like an online palette of uh, on-screen palette of controls. But you know the the eye gaze stuff. Um, Basically, if you've got a game that is, you know, it's, it's the same with other software. You know, if you've, as long as your hit area is big enough and you've got simple mouse controls, then it just kind of works. And that's what's nice about it as well is that, again, like with accessibility in other industries, if you're doing that kind of stuff, if you're making decent size interface elements, you're not only making it work with eye tracking, you're also making it work for someone who has Parkinson's, who has difficulty doing accurate movements with a mouse. If you're using decent size interface elements, you're also making it accessible to people who have um, impaired vision. Also, people who have temporarily impaired vision. You know, I'm sure there's an experience of trying to operate a fiddly interface on your phone in direct sunlight. You know? So all these other groups. And that's what's nice about it in gaming is because gaming is there's such a um, kind of like open creative field. It's nice that you do have these kind of things where it points to a general good way of doing things. A lot of these accessibility features, they are just good general game design that benefits all players. Okay, awesome. Very cool. Um, if there's do you have any more questions? If there's no more questions, then I guess we can um, wrap it up. Do you see any? Uh, I don't see any in Twitter. Mm, Mikhail, no. do you have any more? <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> Right now, um, <laughs> mm, 
No, not really. Uh, uh, yeah, I think I have. That was awesome. Yeah, a little bit more about um, input devices, because there's been a one, well, on the horizon big, not from last year so much, but for this year, which is VR, which is bringing all kinds of interesting right. game accessibility. So I mean, there's, there's like big opportunities with that, you know, for people with people um, to be able to experience things they can't do in everyday life. But there's the accessibility issues with it as well. And actually, that's, um, VR is a really, really nice example of, you know, what I was talking about, about um, keeping the momentum going. Because with the kind of exponential curve that um, accessibility is going on in gaming, it's kind of, it, it can be easy to be complacent, you know. But things can quite easily slide backwards, which is what's happened with VR, basically. Mm -hmm. So got to the point now. I mean, compared to, you know, five years ago, it was pretty common to find games that didn't have subtitles. Now, standard, really hard to find a game that doesn't have subtitles, apart from VR. So the first kind of generation of games that are coming out with in VR, it's actually really common to find games that don't have any subtitles in them at all, mm -hmm. which is frustrating after it, it got to such a standard thing, you know. And I guess it's something you see in other industries as well. Whenever the new shiny tech comes out, like Canvas, that kind of stuff, you know, mm. same kind of thing. Um, and basically, with, with the subtitles in VR, it's basically because there's a design challenge involved, because there isn't, you know, there isn't a bottom of the screen to display subtitles on. So what do you do? Do you have them hovering in space? Designers don't really like that, having stuff hovering right in front of your face because it kind of breaks immersion. Um, if you do have them hovering in front of you, to avoid them kind of occluding with objects in the environment, they have to be up really, really close to your face. And basically, like, you know, if you hold your finger up in front of your face, focus on your finger, focus on something far away, keep doing that, it, it, that's pretty bad eye strain. So people want to avoid that as well. So that's that option kind of out. The only other option, really, at first at least, is to actually attach the subtitles to the source of the audio, right? So basically like a speech bubble next to someone's head, right? which solves that eye strain problem completely because both things are located at the same depth. But if you do that, that means if there's a sound going on behind you, you have no idea. You have no idea to turn around. So basically, right. I think that's as far as it's getting, is people are thinking, thinking about implementing subtitles, kind of taking it that far, and then, uh, you know what, I won't bother, I'm not including them, which is really frustrating. But there's actually really nice, um, you know, I was talking about the Melbourne developers, there's a really nice prototype that's come out of um, Melbourne, um, which basically is kind of the best of both worlds. So you have your subtitles attached directly to the source of the audio until you turn around, at which point it just snaps onto the side of your vision. So basically, you avoid the eye strain when you are looking at someone, but when you look away, you still get notification that they're speaking. You can see what they say, notify you to turn around. So um, that's the hope, you know, that that kind of stuff, uh, once those kind of solutions become available in VR, you know, it's still early days. So if you can get decent, accessible solutions in there early, then other people will copy them, and those will just kind of become the standards. And hopefully things can move out from VR into the rest of the industry as well. So kind of the lessons people learn. The thing for that really is um, for simulation sickness. So basically that's what um, killed the previous VR industry in the early 90s, was basically the investors getting jittery over... Um... So it's all fine for me, Johnny? Okay now, yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, so simulation sickness. Basically, all the investors got really jittery in the 90s about reports of people getting ill from playing VR and basically pulled out and killed the industry. So this time around, there's been a lot, a lot of effort in simulation sickness. Loads of, loads of money being poured into the research. And nice guidelines. So, for example, Oculus have published a nice guidelines document that's freely available to all developers. So it'd be really, really nice if the developers take those lessons that they're learning from VR and apply them outside of VR as well. Because that's something that's really, really common in... Um, it's not really talked about a lot, but it's really, really common in games outside of VR. It's like first-person games, third-person games. People are getting really, really ill from playing them, which that's something that I've started to get as well as I started to get older. Um, there was Alien Isolation was the first game that I had it badly enough that I couldn't actually play the game, which is so frustrating because I really wanted to play the game. But, um, yeah, so it's things like um, having a, a field of view angle that is mismatched to your angle to the screen, mm -hmm. effects that games make a lot of use of. So, for example, having a delay on your movement or having motion blur or having, um, if you're in first-person view, 
having your head actually bobbing up and down and the weapon bobbing up and down in front of you. All those kind of things that basically create that mismatch between what you're seeing and what your brain is expecting to see okay. and okay. end up with, you know, people, people can only play, you know, for five minutes before they have to stop. The short season is great. Yeah. This, is, this, is awesome. this is awesome. This is fascinating. Awesome. Awesome. Unfortunately, 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 we have to we have to cut this because we have to move on to our next talk in ten minutes. Cool. This is it was so great having you, man. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. It was amazing. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. And uh, to everyone out there, stick around. We'll have Ashley Bischoff, who's a TPG uh, colleague. She's going to be presenting in about ten minutes, uh, embracing plain language for better accessibility. So again. Thank you, Ian, and uh, glad you landed safely today. And uh, look forward to look forward to seeing you again soon. Right. Thanks for having me. Cheers, Will. Thanks a lot, everyone. Awesome. All right. See you soon.